Now, the heated war of words between the U.S. and Iran has taken on a frantic pace. Accusations over nuclear weapons programs, assassinations, spying, and talk of red lines have brought these enemies to the brink of armed conflict, a fight with global implications. So how did these nations get so close to war? Are they, in fact, getting close to war? Let's uh, take a look. In November, the UN's nuclear watchdog, the IAEA, reported that Iran was conducting research that could only be used to develop a nuclear trigger. Later that month, the U.S. imposed tough sanctions targeting Iran's oil and petrochemical industry. In December, stating that the sanctions were a threat to its economic survival, Iran pledged to block the flow of regional oil through the Strait of Hormuz, where an estimated 17 million barrels of oil transit each day. Well, the U.S. said that that would be a red line and days later passed sanctions targeting Iran's central bank. This month, Iran announced the capture of an accused spy, a former U.S. Marine who is now sentenced to death. And just last week, a fourth Iranian nuclear scientist was murdered with a car bomb. Now, Iran blamed the U.S. and said retribution would be, quote, tormenting. So can conflict be avoided? And who actually is responsible for this buildup? Of course, Vali and Mark are here to help us pull this apart. So let's get started. Vali, is this Cold War of sorts worse than it's been in recent times? Uh, yes, it is worse than it has been. For about two years, the situation between the United States and Iran was somewhat stable. They were not warm relations, but they were within a certain band of American uh, pressure, and Iranians, by and large, ignored the sanctions and followed with uh, both their enrichment activities and their general foreign policy. Now, the United States has escalated tensions with Iran. It has put more sanctions on Iran, more pressure, and the Iranians are seeing this as now an existential threat to the regime. If you cut their oil, uh, how are they going to actually manage things? So they've begun reacting, threatening that they're going to close the Straits of Hormuz, they're going to bring an economic war to the West, put pressure on U.S. and the United States. So we've gone from a period of America applying pressure, Iran merely pushing back a bit, to a, to a situation where both are threatening one another in ways they haven't done before. Some people have called it a game of chicken, Valley. Would you define it like that? Well, it, it is a game of chicken in the sense that each side is trying to bluff the other one. The United States wants to, mm -hmm. Iranians to sort of be really scared of these sanctions and therefore abide by what is being asked of them. And the Iranians want the United States to really think twice about it's got its pressure. poker face on. It's a yeah. poker face. And yeah. then the question is, who's going to blink first? Yeah. Now, Mark, you've written a fascinating expose, this exclusive article you wrote on foreign policy called False Flag. Uh, and uh, let me just read uh, the headline. A series of CIA memos describes how Israeli Mossad agents posed as American spies to recruit members of the terrorist organization Jundullah, who operate from Pakistan, on the border with Pakistan and Iran, to fight their covert war against uh, Iran. It suggests that Israel is attempting perhaps to get Iran to maybe fire the first shot, the opening uh, salvo. Uh, tell me about some of the feedback that you've received to this article so far. Well, the real controversial part of the article is that Mossad officers posed as CIA mm -hmm. officers. I think what's lost in that is that Israel is actually recruiting a terrorist organization. Uh, an organization that's on the foreign terrorist list of the State Department that we have no association with. Uh, and, it, and it puts us in a very difficult position in the United States because it means we're allied with a nation that's recruiting terrorists from an organization that has, in public, been affiliated with, uh, with Al-Qaeda and other nefarious organizations. And, it's very yeah. uncomfortable and, for and us. And I read your article quite closely. Uh, it, it seems as if the CIA and, and the administration has known about this for about four years, three to four years, uh, more or less. Uh, in terms of the response or lack thereof, there seems to have been nothing said or done from the United States towards Israel after he did this. Uh, initially, during the Bush administration, the information that I've got and reported in the article was that there was no pushback, but this was the result more of bureaucratic inertia, uh, inertia rather mm. than uh, a real decision. Since then, the Obama administration has put John Dalla on the foreign terrorist organization list, uh, and I have reason to believe that we've pushed back pretty hard on Israel to not conduct these kinds of operations using these kinds of terrorist organizations. I don't know whether Israel is still doing that, whether they're really affiliated with John Dalla, or whether 
in fact, this most recent incident in Iran is a result of that. Okay, let's uh, uh, bring in uh, Mayer Javidanfer, who's our other guest, uh, talk about the Israeli role in all of this. He joins us from uh, Tel Aviv. He's an Iranian-Israeli lecturer at the Interdisciplinary Center, Herzliya. Welcome, Maya. Uh, you've just heard from uh, both our guests, Mark and Vali. Do you agree with them uh, that the situation is extremely ominous between the United States and Iran at this moment in time, with Israel an integral character in this plot? Um, yes, well, I agree that we are dealing with a very delicate situation here. And Israel, whether likes it or not, whether it's involved or not, it's going to be involved. I refer you to a statement made about uh, four years ago by the current head of the Iranian Majlis, Mr. Ali Larijani, who was then the head of the Supreme National Security Council, who said that if America attacks Iran, we will put Israel in a wheelchair. So if, whether Israel likes it or not, whether Israel provokes or doesn't, Israel is a part of this. And it's, it is, of course, very concerning. It is concerning that we might see a war, which is something that we don't want, and so nobody wants that. And on the other side of the equation, here in Israel, one of the few bar, uh, partisan issues that exists is that nobody wants to see a nuclear-armed Islamic Republic of Iran. There are some people who say it's existential, some people say, who say it is not. But what all agree with is that they don't want to see the uh, nuclear arm, the Ayatollah Khamenei and, and his regime. So the question is, how are we going to get there? Are we going to get there through sanctions, through threats? Well, the hope, I think, here also in Israel is that we're going to get there through negotiations. But I have to say that after President Obama tried to reach an agreement with, uh, with the, Mr. Khamenei at the, in Geneva in 2009, and Ayatollah Khamenei rejected it, and went to the Turks and the Brazilians instead, I think a lot of people here lost hope. It's interesting that you say that, that Khamenei rejected uh, Barack Obama and, and went to the Turks and the Brazilians instead. Vali, there's another way of looking at it, isn't it? It's that finally the Turks and the Brazilians came to the table. They brought something worthwhile where the Turks and Brazilians can do the uranium enrichment on behalf of the Iranians to show that there's no weaponization. But that was quashed immediately. Um, the United States responded with further mm -hmm. sanctions, and even the New York Times, if I remember correctly, there was, um, let me find this, this quote. Immediately afterwards, the New York Times had a headline, Iran deal seen as spot on Brazilian leaders' legacy. I, in a way, you know, showing that it, it's wrong for Brazil and Turkey to get involved. So do you believe that there's been bad faith on, on both sides, Vali? Well, you know, the Obama administration uh, followed the policy of, on the one hand, offering uh, talks to Iran initially, and on the other hand, uh, relying heavily on uh, economic pressure in order to get the talks going. But over the past two years, it has been far more emphatic on the economic pressure and far less uh, diligent in actually diplomacy. Hmm. So yes, they tried in Geneva, and Geneva didn't work, but they very quickly abandoned the idea of talking. And uh, when other uh, governments, Turkey and Brazil, tried to come in the middle, it wasn't a good deal. But it was a deal that potentially could have served as the basis for more conversation. So by and large, you know, Meyer's right that, that uh, you know, there's very little hope now of getting back to where we were two years ago. But I think the administration was uh, short on diplomacy and long on pressure and mm -hmm. didn't match these two very well. And it's relied on sanctions being a stable situation. And, it, and one, we can now look and say that this policy has failed. Hmm. Sanctions are not going to get Iran to the table very clearly, and sanctions are not stable. They're not going to actually cause war. So uh, it's, a, it's, it's the end of really the idea that sanctions work. Right. Uh, you know, our community has a lot to say about this. It's a very broad topic, as we were discussing earlier. But Mark, your article certainly has attracted a lot of attention. Uh, Osiris322 on Twitter says, Israel's false flag killing of yet another Iranian scientist dishonors U.S. public, sullies with lawless barbaric act in the eyes of the world. But then a pointed question to you from, uh, you know, uh, the Twitter account Iran News Now saying, question for Mark Perry, what will the impact of the public revelation of the false flag op be on the policy of Obama administration in the future? I mean, I know we discussed the past, but going forward, do you anticipate anything? Israel is a strategic ally of the United States. We have deep rooted relationship with Israel. Uh, this isn't going to break it apart. Uh, I think we're trying to reach an understanding with Israel what's possible to do with Iran and what's not. It's a bump in the road. 
I don't think it'll have a long-term impact. It's embarrassing. Uh, the Israeli government wishes this revelation hadn't come out. I'm sure that's true on the part of the United States or some people in the United States. So long-term, I don't think it's going to have a real impact. Meyer, Meyer, what do you think? Bump in the road, no long-term impact? Uh, well, the Israeli government has dismissed Mark's uh, article saying that, you know, uh, the, it was in Haaretz that they said that if Israel, uh, Mayor Dagan, who was the former head of the Mossad at that time, he was the head of the Mossad, had done something like that, he wouldn't be able to set foot in, in, in Washington. But let's just assume, yes, you know, I hope it's not true. I, I really, you know, I'm also an Iranian and an Israeli. I, I see how people of Israel are, are scared of the Iranian regime. And of course, Israeli people have a right to defend themselves uh, after all that's happened with the suicide bombings that the Iranian government has, has financed on the streets of Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. But I don't see uh, financing Jundullah, if it is true, as, as the right way to fight the, the Iranian regime, because Jundullah is a terrorist organization, pure and simple. So I'm hoping and praying that this is wrong. It really makes me worried when I, when, you know, I remember Jundula once carrying out a suicide operation inside a mosque. They killed many innocent people. So I'm hoping and praying that, you know, it's, this is wrong, that we didn't do this. But uh, if it is true, I think it's the wrong way of addressing this problem. But in the long run, in terms of relationship between the United States and the state of Israel, I agree with the, with the bump of bumping the road analogy. The relationship is incredibly strong. Uh, we have very, very strong relations. Uh, of course, I think there could be more done more. I think Prime Minister Netanyahu could do a lot more to, to, to help President Obama, especially in the peace process. I don't think Prime Minister Netanyahu is doing anywhere near enough. Uh, these settlement expansion policies is, is hurting our, our, our American allies. But in the long term, I think we have very strong relationship, and I don't so, think it's going to damage so it. So perhaps some would even describe it as indestructible. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll go to you now, just shifting gears slightly. As you know, uh, Vali, uh, Iran sentenced a former Marine uh, to death. And we have a question from Naveed on this for you. Let's take a listen. Hi, Al Jazeera. My name is Naveed. I'm from DC. And my question is, how will Iran's death sentence of a US Marine impact nuclear negotiations. Thanks. Well, uh, given what's happened, uh, uh, given the killing of, a, of an Iranian scientist on the streets of Tehran, I think that plays very badly for this young former Marine. Because uh, the, the Iranian intelligence officials would like to tell the Iranian public and their bosses that they, are, they have a handle on this. And they have arrested somebody, and uh, they, and conveniently that person is connected to the Marines and the United States. Right. So this young man, guilty or not, and more than likely is not guilty, he's innocent because he wouldn't have gone to Iran with right. his for name fully public if he was really an agent, is going to be the sacrificial lamp in order mm -hmm. to restore the honor of Iran's uh, national community. But, but the problem is that once you go through with this, if they actually execute him, uh, then it would make it much more difficult for the United States to uh, not re react uh, right. in some way that would make these negotiations more difficult. And, and to quickly to the gentleman's question, any effect on the nuclear negotiations? Well, it, it, the effect is that, uh, you know, if the Iranians do something that then would create bad uh, right. vibes right. here, that then the United States will have to do something in retaliation for the right. uh, uh, execution of a citizen, mm. then that would uh, make it much more difficult to say, well, let's meet next month in Istanbul. Right. And Mark, given your expertise on, on all things murky in the intelligence world, this latest scientist, Mustafa Ahmadi Roshan, the latest to be killed you know, on the streets um, of Tehran, how likely is it, as the Iranians claim, that the United States was behind that assassination? I don't think I've heard such a, cor a, cor a categorical denial as given by Hillary Clinton and mm. Leon Panetta. It was absolutely categorical, and I believe it. We didn't have anything to who do with it. Who did it then? Uh, I'm not, I don't know who did it, but I do know that the, that the operation was very sophisticated, a magnetic bomb. This wasn't, uh, this wasn't probably a Jandala operation. They've been eroded over the last uh, two or three years. It probably wasn't MEK. It might have been internal. But whoever it was, it was a very sophisticated operation. And Leon Panetta has given us a hint. He says they think they have a good idea, and he gave a half smile. So we have to draw our own conclusions. Uh, Maya, what do you think of, of that? Possibilities of Mossad being involved in the assassination I mean, of these scientists? 
in, in the murky world of intelligence, people don't leave visiting cards after hits. Uh, they, we don't know. You know, there are some educated assumptions being made based on past uh, past behavior. Uh, none of it has been can be proved that that it was Mossad or USA. But you know, in the 1950s, the Mossad was going after Nazi missile experts who were helping Egypt that, at that time to build missiles. So. People are using that to say that it could be Mossad. We don't know. It's it's an assumption. It could be perhaps internal, uh, the regime trying to prop up its its uh, popularity, especially with the Majlis elections coming. Uh, a former Iranian ambassador who is uh, who is a member of the uh, Green Movement, has, who has now defected, actually said that the gentleman, Mr. Ahmadi Roshan, who has been assassinated, wrote a letter two months before to the government complaining about the way the, the nuclear file is being handled, that is bringing so much sanctions and misery. So it could be that at this time, we don't know. All, all we have is, a, is a assumptions. Mm. Uh, Vali, I want to talk a bit about you know, Iran's nuclear ambitions. Iran publicly states it's, it's only for uh, peaceful purposes. Uh, as Maya had said and others have said that a nuclear Iran, i.e., with nuclear weapons capability, is completely unacceptable. I wonder, you know, in 2002, uh, George W. Bush labeled the axes of evil. He said Iraq, North Korea, mm -hmm. and uh, Iran. Iraq was attacked and was defenseless against the American invasion, didn't have the WMDs that the United States had claimed that it had, and Saddam Hussein was overrun. North Korea, very soon afterwards, decides to uh, escalate its nuclear weapons capability, and everybody leaves it alone nowadays. North Korea, hasn't attacked South Korea, even though it has um, publicly threatened South Korea far more than Iran has threatened Israel, for example. And it hasn't you know, created this black market, hasn't sold nuclear weapons to any terrorist groups or non-state actors. I wonder, with that in mind, why shouldn't Iran have a nuclear weapon? Uh, it's, it's a great deterrent uh, right. uh, tool to have, isn't it? Well, actually, the argument uh, within Iran and the argument generally for why Iran may should change its mind and go from a peaceful to a military deterrent is actually increasing. Uh, look at Libya. Gaddafi and Saif al-Islam were everything that we've been telling Iran they should do. Hmm. And look what happened to Gaddafi. And in fact, in 2004, the Supreme Leader said Gaddafi was an idiot, and he was proven right. So if you give up the weapons and the sanctions that weakened you, and the students go back in the streets of Tehran, uh, you're, you, can, you have nothing to prevent from NATO or outsiders from interfering this time. And therefore, uh, actually, uh, the, the combination of sanctions weakening Iran and the potential for unrest means that Iran would actually accelerate towards nuclear deterrence. Secondly, uh, look at the situation now. If Iran agreed to come to a meeting in Geneva or Istanbul and even did positive talks, will they get sanctions on the central banks lifted? The answer is no. Mm. Would the arms the United States has sold Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates be returned to the United States? The answer is no. Would the oil embargo the Europeans putting against Iran, would they be lifted? No. Iran has to give a lot before it gets some of these things lifted. It's almost better for Iran now, if you are in their position, to get to nuclear position, to get to North Korea, and then try to negotiate right. these sanctions off, rather than try to do them through uh, through negotiation, particularly because Iran really doesn't have trust in negotiations. Just as much as the United States distrusts Iran, they also distrust the, uh, the, the outcome. They think that these negotiations are a way to yeah. ensnare them in some sort of a trick that then will topple the yeah, regime. Yeah, that, that you know, mistrust going back to 1953 and maybe even uh, before that. Ahmed, let's get a bit more feedback just before we leave the show. Yeah, we'll squeeze it in. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, this is a very controversial topic historically, but also a very polarized one. And perhaps Nicholas Slayton on Twitter summarizes it best. He says to us, no side is right or wrong, but extremists on both ends, US, Israel, and Iran, are stupidly pushing the world toward war. So let's take this last video question on that topic from Michael Osterlink. If the Iranians were to retaliate against alleged U.S. involvement in the assassination of Iranian scientists, do you think they do so uh, in Afghanistan, uh, U.S. troops still in Iraq, perhaps uh, American targets in South and Central America? So where might Iran retaliate against the U.S.? Well, they've already given a hint. They've said that they will retaliate outside the region. And they've done in the past. They retaliated once for Israeli attacks in South Lebanon 
against uh, Hezbollah and their targets in Argentina. Two bomb, two massive, right. brutal bombings in Argentina. Mark, any t any idea? I think that Iran has a lot of capability and they can do it, which is what makes this so dangerous. If, after all, if you're assassinating their scientists, they can assassinate yours. Right. And that would be a clear signal that they're disapproving of this as they, as they obviously are. If I, could, if I could mention one more thing, I think we have to acknowledge what Meyer said. If you're sitting in Israel and you feel existentially threatened, that everything is on the line, mm -hmm. you will do anything. Mm -hmm. Didn't we in World War II? We sat next to Stalin. Yeah. And, and so we have to acknowledge that reality and, and we have to understand the, the pressure that Israel is under. Okay, gentlemen, it's been absolutely fascinating and we're going to continue this fascinating discussion in the post show. Uh, Mayor uh, uh, Vali and Mark, uh, do stay where you are. We'll continue the discussion on the post show. Stream.aljazeera.com is where you can catch it. Ahmed, you stay where you are as well. We want some more feedback on Tuesday. We'll uh, look at why Hungarians are protesting against their country's new constitution. Until then, we'll see you online. Welcome back to the post show on stream.aljazeera.com. We're talking about all the different permutations uh, related to the discussion uh, um, of Iran and the United States, Iran and the so-called international community, Iran and Israel, and everything related to that. We've got uh, Mark Perry, we've got Vali Nasser, and we have uh, Mayor Javidanfar still on the line via Skype as well. Mayor, M Mark made a really good point there uh, in, in recognizing the Israeli narrative. I mean, many people would not accept or believe that Iran wants to commit national suicide by nuking Israel and they, they're, thereby guaranteeing its own destruction. However, there's still a feeling that Iran is an existential threat. If you would, how do you qualify that fear of Iran in Israel at this moment in time? Um. In, in, Israel, in Israel, you know, the, I'm an Iranian Israeli, and, and I, you know, uh, my family, we left after the revolution. And to be honest with you, I tell, I tell the Israelis, you know, the, wh why should we be scared of a country, of a regime that's scared of Barbie dolls? You know, today they issued an order to collect all Barbie dolls in Iran because the regime considers this as a threat, you know, a Western invasion. But, you know, uh, uh, Imran, when this regime denied the Holocaust, I cannot begin to tell you what it did to the psyche of Israelis. This is the damage that caused, the fear that it instilled in the minds and hearts of the people of Israel who are traumatized by it, has made Iran an unignorable threat. Yes, I don't think the Iranians would use a nuclear bomb. But when you have a combination of a regime that's called for the elimination of Israel, and you've got a president who's basically said that the Holocaust is a denial, and we never saw Ayatollah Khamenei uh, shut him up or to say that this is wrong what you're doing, then the people here have a genuine concern. And I have to tell you another thing. People here don't want war. You know, no matter what you hear in the news about Israelis being warmonger, please, you know, I live here. People here have suffered enough. They want more than anything to be a peaceful solution. And as an Iranian Israeli, let me tell you, Israelis would love to have relations with Iran. I teach in my course, uh, Iranian studies, I've got the most enthusiastic students. Even when you speak to Israelis, there's positive discrimination. You could talk about other nationalities in the Middle East. As soon as you talk about Iran, you talk about Persians, there is a positive discrimination. They look up to us. So this is a situation that really has to be saved. And I think the first thing is for the Iranian government to stop these threats, to stop calling for the elimination of the state of Israel, and also to negotiate with us. You know, we are both countries in the region. Why doesn't the Iranian government want to negotiate with the state of Israel? Interestingly put. Ahmed? You know, it's funny. We have a lot of people online who are echoing each other. 
Uh, for example, this tweet from Urabis saying, the closer we look at the parties involved, Iran, US, and Israel, the more obvious it becomes all three are morally bankrupt. You know, and, and perhaps this is a bit extreme, but even Der Blutan saying the UK, the US, and Israeli administrations are completely lawless. And just to put it to picture, <laughs> we have Sohail uh, also chiming in. Let's listen into his comment. Suhail from the UK. They are as bad as each other. US Israel illegally assassinating nuclear scientists and Iran illegally serving death sentences to any suspects with uh, US slings. So all this saber rattling, you know, threatening to close the Strait of Hormuz and you know even all these threats of attacking Iran or you know whether it's pundits or people within the administration, it all seems really insane. Uh, at least uh, to use that word according to our community. I mean, in terms of its realistic, uh, I know it seems like a nagging question now, do you, do you really, are you personally fearful that perhaps we've reached a point of no return? Well, I'm, I'm actually fearful that uh, we've reached a point where uh, the, the United States, Israel, Iran, or United Kingdom may not be able to control the situation. You know, Iran and the United States have no relationship with one another. One another. There's no embassy, there's no hotline. They are talking very tough. Right. They are in very close quarters in the Persian Gulf. And it's very easy that you would have one incident, and then that incident, uh, the other country feels compelled to answer. And you have an escalation. I mean, that's the reason why both Hillary Clinton and Leon Panetta were so quick to come out and say, we have nothing to do with the assassination of this scientist. Right. But you know, there might be yet another assassination or yet another event, and you can have misunderstanding in this kind of an environment lead to uh, an escalation that right. gets out of hand. And you yourself said that there's very little incentive for Iran, even if there were negotiations, uh, to do anything, you know, and perhaps give a peace to the U.S. And well, well, I also think if you look at Iran's rhetoric and behavior in the past two, three weeks, you have to conclude that there has been a decision made in Iran to, to, uh, to provide a very aggressive face to the West. Right. And I think that's their game plan. It's a dangerous game plan. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, they're, they're talking tough. They're saying things like, you better not return your aircraft carrier to the Gulf or, other, or, or else. Right. So, you know, that's, that's the Iranian game plan, and that's a very dangerous, risky game plan. I, I see that. I think he wants to comment. Yeah, Go Meyer, ahead, do you want to chime in? Sure. I've got a question, actually, to uh, Professor Vali Nasr. Professor Nasr, do you think Ayatollah Khamenei, in his heart of hearts, wants to have relations with the United States when, when he had the opportunity to reach a deal with Barack Obama? He turned him away, and he went and dealt with the Brazilians and the Turks. And also, the Americans set up an internet, a virtual um, embassy on the internet, and he even blocked that. Do you think that he, knowing that relations with the United States would mean uh, human rights, the issue of human rights coming up, destroying years of education and brainwashing of the Iranian people that America is evil, do you think that he would willingly and voluntarily have good relations with the United States? No, and, and I think we're, we're quite far from actually the question of good relations with the United States. I mean, what's on the table now is whether or not you can reduce the tensions a notch or two. And uh, that's possible, that might be possible. Uh, and also, you know, uh, it's very clear, I, I think the Iranians also would think that the United States really doesn't want to talk to them. Otherwise, the president would not be addressing the Iranian public directly, would have an a answered the president of Iran's you know, letter of congratulations when he became president, and would have followed up much more uh, uh, on, on the opportunity, at least, that the, that the Turks and the Brazilians uh, presented. And I uh, think also the United States is very correct in, in being suspicious that Ayatollah Khamenei is actually uh, really looking for peace. But you know, in many cases, the, the, you know, the two sides would, would, are, are in a position of an impasse. They need a way out. They may not like one another. The question is whether there is any kind of a room uh, to, to create some kind of a positive movement. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna ask Mark about the internal US dynamic here because we, you know, we've spoken a little bit about the dynamic between Ayatollah Khamenei and Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and the fact that there is division and discuss, uh, discussion and debate within Iran itself. In the United States, uh, 2012 elections, we've seen with all the GOP candidates, perhaps barring Ron Paul, they've all been uh, completely hawkish regarding Iran, Rick Santorum even sort of publicly fantasizing, hoping that the United States was behind the assassination of um, Iranian scientists. With 
these GOP candidates being very hawkish on Iran, it's going to be it's it's going to be very unlikely that Barack Obama is going to be overly conciliatory on the campaign trail in the build up to November. To what extent is that adding unnecessary strain to the relationship between Iran and the U.S.? I'm a writer. I look at I look at language, and I think the language that the Republican candidates are using can be dangerous. There's nothing inevitable about war. There's nothing inevitable about a conflict. And the more people ask, don't you think that war is inevitable? I just feel us getting closer to that point. On, on the other hand, you know, Rick Santorum doesn't conduct foreign policy in the United States. Mm. Uh, the President of the United States does. And I don't sense on the part of the White House, the State Department, uh, to the degree uh, that I know this, the agency, the military, nobody I talk to in the foreign policy establishment says, let's go. People are very worried, they view this as a crisis, and everyone I talk to wants to pull back. Do you, Vali, do you think no, that's true? I, I, I agree with what Mark said, but, but I think the wrong assumption that the administration makes is that if you cut a country's source of income completely, uh, then it's an act of war. I mean, uh, we may call it additional sanctions, but it's a point at which sanctions are not just punishment and pressure. They essentially uh, become uh, but, an yeah. instrument do, of do you think? But do you think the Iranians are going to actually respond by cutting off the Strait of Hormuz because of the embargo affecting its oil exports? Do you think the Iranians would actually do that? No, I think that the talk about the Straits yeah. of Hormuz is designed to jack up the oil prices mm -hmm. as a warning shot uh, to the West. It also is beneficial to them because if they're going to be exporting less oil, if they get more money for per barrel for the oil they sell, they, they, they do better. But I think they may react in other ways. Uh, you, th there is a possibility that they may, if they feel desperate, if they feel that the, the pressure is actually going to finally undermine the stability of the regime, that they're going to treat these sanctions essentially as if you send aircrafts uh, to bomb a site. And, and so, so the war does not come only when the United States decides to send F-16s to a hit a target. Excellent point, excellent point, Mark. And Valley is, is right. You know, sanctions push us in a direction we don't want to go in. But if you're Barack Obama sitting in the White House and you offer Iran a deal, listen, we'll drop the sanctions, you drop your nuclear program, that's going to be called appeasement in this country. And it's going to be very, very unpopular. And he's got to be aware of that. I'm sure he is. Well, I, I also think, if I can jump in here, sure. uh, the, 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 the Russians did something like this, Mark. You know, there was this step-by-step -step approach that uh, Sergei Lavrov uh, suggested to the Iranians and Hillary Clinton backed it. And then, you know, there was all, in, in one week, there were two, two trips between the, Supreme, the head of the Supreme National Security Council, Mr. Jalili, to Moscow, and the head of the uh, National Security Council, the Russian National Security Council coming to Tehran. It looked great. And all of a sudden, the Iranians looked at the text, and he said, OK, we are looking at a step-by-step -step approach where Iran answers questions and the West lifts sanctions. Great. And then all of a sudden, the Russians also said they want Iran to cooperate with them on other regional security matters. And the Iranians said, hang on a minute. So what do the Russians want from us now? Not only to answer questions on IAEA, are they looking for our influence in Syria? And that fell apart. So I think the framework of that is, is a good idea to, to apply. But to be honest with you guys, nothing's going to happen until Iran answers the questions with the IAEA regarding these nuclear triggers uh, that they were working on. I think that would be a Probably very not. positive first step that the Iranian government could take to, to reduce the tensions. And that would make it very difficult for President Obama not to respond. OK, Maya, I'm going to let that be the last word on uh, this topic. We've covered a lot of ground. We could be here for another hour or so or even longer. It's been riveting and very informative. Thank you very much, you. Uh, gentlemen. Before we go, Ahmed has some of the other story leads that we've been tracking. Thank you. Thank you, Imran. Well, today in our lead section, we're giving you a quick look at stories we're following here. Our first lead comes from Mexico, where a famine led to the mass suicide of 50 indigenous people. The Terra Humara people who reside in the Sierra Madre have been battling a drought and freeze since last year. Now, in response, civil society groups and activists are mobilizing a food collection using the hashtag Sierra Tarahumara. Now, our next lead is about an app that enables your Android phone to detect radiation. Now, let's take a quick look at this video. Using sensors already in your phone's camera to detect high-energy particles, a sign of radioactivity, the app essentially turns your device into a Geiger counter. Radiation levels are then displayed on the screen, as you see right here in red. 
And uh, that's one we'll definitely be following. Now, our final story comes from India, where the government is suing U.S. agricultural giant Monsanto for biopiracy. The suit alleges the company stole genes from local varieties of Brinjal, which is eggplant, and developed a genetically modified version. Now, Indian officials say Monsanto should have offered compensation to the communities who cul cultivated the crops for generations. Monsanto is one of the largest agricultural companies in the world and is frequently in the headlines for suing small producers who use its patented seeds without license. The company has yet to respond to the charges. And those are our stream leads for today. For more on these stories, you could visit us at stream.aljazeera.com forward slash leads. Cast your vote for the stories you're interested in, and we might feature them on an upcoming show. Imran? Ahmed, thanks for that. Uh, thank you, all of you, for joining me, Ahmed Shihabuddin, uh, Vali Nasser, Mark Perry, and Mayra Javedan Fur, who joined us via Skype. We had a fascinating discussion regarding Iran uh, and the United States. Hope to have you gentlemen on the show again in the not too distant future. Reminder on Tuesday, we look at why Hungarians are protesting against their country's new constitution. Until then, we'll see you online. Bye-bye.